We are in the life of Jacob, and last time we were together, we saw the fact that Jacob had made his way. He now had uh, realized he'd been believing a lie for a long time, that his sons had told him that Joseph was not dead. He had not been devoured by a ravenous animal, but rather he was over in Egypt and had been appointed to be prime minister and was second in command and basically ruling over Egypt and all the land. And uh, Joseph finally revealed himself to his uh, brothers. The brothers went back and told his dad. Dad didn't first believe it till he heard the words and saw the, the uh, wagons that Joseph had sent. And so he believed it. His heart was revived. And he goes back over there and he sees Joseph. He's, he gets a word from God. He gets a new vision about things. And he wants to live life and to see his son and his life satisfied. Well, he goes over into Egypt. And when he gets there... Uh, Joseph, who is in command, he wants to give his family the best of the land for their shepherds. And so he sets it up to be able to ask Pharaoh, for them to tell Pharaoh their shepherds. And he asked Pharaoh to give them the best of the land, the land of Goshen. And Pharaoh was more than gracious to do that with all that Joseph had provided for him. And so Jacob and all of those sons and their families go into the land of Goshen and they begin to settle that land. One of the neat things about the experience there is as Jacob actually has a chance to bless Pharaoh. Isn't that something? When Jacob is the one who's blessing Pharaoh on two different occasions. He lived there for about 17 years. 17 years after they traveled over to Egypt in the Goshen land. And uh, after those 17 years, his health begins to wane and he is coming to the end of his journey. So today what we're talking about is, is the end days of his life. And one of the things that he does in regard to that is Joseph brings the two sons that have been born to him while in Egypt, Ephraim and Manasseh, and brings those to him and wants him to bless his sons. And uh, Jacob is more than glad to do that, even though if you'll remember the story, whenever Manasseh's oldest and he wants him to be placed on the side where Jacob would put his right hand on his head because he was the oldest and Ephraim was the youngest, his hand would be on the left-hand side. Uh, he wanted to make sure that the oldest gets the blessing or the greater blessing. But uh, according to the plan of God, when, it, when they came before Jacob, Israel, he actually crossed his hands, if you remember, and he placed the blessing hand more on Ephraim than on Manasseh. It didn't please uh, Joseph very much, but Jacob said, it is the will of God that both will be blessed, but this is the plan of God. But what I want you to see today is that after this man has journeyed, remember he started out a rascal. Just remember about his life. He, he, wasn't, he wasn't the best of people. He was a Jacob, he was the old deceiver, the heel grabber, the one who had tricked her. He, he, had, he had deceived his brother out of, uh, out of the birthright and, and, and the blessing, deceived his own dad, went over to, had to leave the country and go to his uncle Laban. Even over there, Laban tricked him about who the wife was, but he's going to get Laban back because he ended up taking all of Laban's wealth and, and God's blessings through that. He took the goats and the sheep, and, and, and he left the country. I mean, Jacob was just kind of a rascal as he was, but, but then there was a change in his life. If you remember, that change happens in his life whenever he wrestles with the angel of God. And, and the angel of God asks him, Who are you, or what is your name, or by what are you called? And he says, I'm Jacob, which was a point of confession, a confession of his sin, that he was a trickster and a deceiver. And then he said, no longer will your name be called Jacob, but you'll be Israel, one who's striven with God and man and prevailed, a prince of God. And his life had been changed. And from that point on, uh, you see that Jacob and Israel, their hearts are in tune with God. He has a really rough journey in the fact that he believed that lie for so many years that his sons had told him. But here is a man who comes to the end of his years, the end of his life, and he's about to give a blessing to the sons of Joseph, and he describes himself. Now, I think it's, I think it's great whenever you can describe yourself in relationship to God. And, and Jacob describes his journey and his relationship with God. It's something for somebody else to describe you, but it's, some, it's a totally different thing for you to describe your journey with God. And through this blessing... He points out his relationship with this God. Listen to what it says in chapter 48. I want to begin reading in verse 13. And Joseph took them both, Ephraim, with his right hand towards Israel's left, and Manasseh with his left hand towards Israel's right, and brought them close to him. But Israel stretched out his right hand and laid on the head of Ephraim 
who was the younger, and his left hand on Manasseh, the head of the cro hand, head, crossing his hands, although Manasseh was the firstborn. Now, this is what it says in 15, 16. And he blessed Joseph and said, The God before whom my father Abraham and Isaac walked, the God who has been my shepherd all my life to this day, the angel who has redeemed me from all evil, bless the lads, and may my name live on in them, and the names of my fathers Abraham and Isaac, and may they grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth. Three statements that he makes about his relationship with God. The first thing he says to Joseph, now you got to remember this, Joseph has not been with his father for a number of those years whenever he was over there in, in, uh, under the leadership of the Egyptians. He was prime minister. He still had a walk with God, but he hadn't been under the leadership of his dad. He hadn't been being taught by his dad. Now as his dad is closing out, he's wanting to make sure that Joseph understands the relationship that he has with God. And the first thing he says is that I serve a God that is a God of my heritage. A God of my heritage. This is a God that my fathers walked with. Well, really, when he says father, he says his father was Isaac and his grandfather was Abraham. He said, the first experience that I had with God is I had a heritage whereby my fathers walked with God. They walked before the Lord. My experience is that I knew that they were men of faith. I saw what God was doing and had done in my grandfather and my father. My first experience is that I saw God and His relationship with them in that relationship with fathers and grandfathers. Now, let me say something to you men, but I say something to all of us as adults. I hope that whenever we would talk to our children, I would hope that we'd be able to say, listen, I want you to know this, that I have a heritage with God, that I have a heritage with the Lord, that, that my father or my mother or my family has walked with the Lord, that they have served the Lord, that my introduction to the cause of faith and this walk with God is the fact that somebody did that in my life. Somebody pointed to me that there was a God and He was real. I don't know about you in your life. Did you have that? I hope you did. I hope that you're not the first generation of believer in your particular family. I was blessed by that. Not so much on my dad's side. My grandfather, my grandmother was a great and godly woman. My grandfather, I don't, I'm not sure if he was saved. I was only 10 years of age whenever he passed away. But I can assure you one thing. On my, grand, on my uh, mother's side, my grandmother and my grandfather, I had a rich heritage in faith. Now, we didn't always agree in theology because he was Church of God. And as a Church of God, he didn't think Baptists were saved anyway. Finally, he, I think after I preached a while, he realized I was actually going to get to go. I might just barely get in, but I was going to get there eventually. But we had all kinds of discussions about things. And, but I want to tell you something. That was a man, he was a man of God. And my grandmother was a woman of God. They had a walk with the Lord. When I think about examples about prayer, I think about my grandparents. Before you could ever go to bed at night, you had to say a Bible verse and pray. And on your knees, you had to say that Bible verse and pray. My favorite Bible verse was in John 11. Jesus wept. That was the only one I could remember, but I, I could remember that one. Jesus wept. And I'd say that Bible verse. And, and you know, and we'd, we'd all say the Bible verse, and then we'd pray. And we'd pray for just, you know, a couple minutes, pray for everybody we knew, everything we knew. And then they'd start praying. And I'm telling you, they would pray, and they would pray. And they'd pray for everybody and everything by name. I mean, they, they'd just pray. I remember sitting there, I was so worn out, I was tired, my knees were hurting. But I just listened to them pray. But at that point, it's kind of aggravating, if you don't know the truth. I was ready to go to bed. Sometimes I just went to sleep right there before they ever got through praying. But did you know that whenever I got older, I realized what a blessing that was, how serious they were about their prayer life. That's not the only thing. In the morning when they woke up, the first thing they did is they hit their knees on the side of their bed and they prayed again. They were godly people. And therefore, I had a heritage of people who had a relationship with God. 
who had a walk with God, that God was a part of their life. I can still see my grandfather. He was a radio preacher. He was a lay preacher, had a radio program. And he'd get on Sunday afternoons. I'd go down there with him. I got to sing on the radio. Not that I wanted to. He'd just put you up there and say, sing. And, uh, you know, all, all those kind of things were just... I remember seeing him sit there with his Bible and that little chair by the, by the fireplace and watch him sit there and read it and read it and then just watch him go to sleep with that Bible in his, in his, uh, in his lap, you know. Those are great things, great heritage. What a wonderful thing it is to be able to say, listen, I saw my father or I saw my grandfather who walked before the Lord, who knew the Lord, who revealed the Lord to me. Now, I hope you had that, but even if you didn't have that, be that. Be that for your children. Be that for your grandchildren. Let them begin that heritage with you if you didn't have it before you so that they would be able to tell their children or their grandchildren, just like Jacob is right now, that I want you to know something. I had a grandfather. I had a father. I had a mother, a grandmother. I had somebody who walked with the Lord, who lived the faith, and who knew Him, and who helped me to realize that God was real. He gives credit to his grandfather and father that they were men who walked with God, who had helped him to understand that God is real, and that he had a heritage that he was thankful for. As he shares that with Joseph, and he shares that with the two sons who never knew Abraham and never knew Isaac, but said, listen, I want you to know something, even though you didn't know them. That heritage that comes through me, that name will carry on through you. What a heritage. But that's not all he says. It's not enough for you to just say this, boy, I want you to know something. I was blessed because I had family who served the Lord. I had family who walked with God. That's great, but that's not enough. That's not where he stops. Listen to what he says next. There in verse 15. The God who has been my shepherd all my life to this very day. Now, if I'd ask you this question, who is it in the Bible? Who is the first one in the Bible who described God as his shepherd? You would have said David. Almost every one of you would have said David. Why? Because he wrote the 23rd Psalm, and the 23rd Psalm begins, The Lord is my shepherd. And every time you hear a message about God is a shepherd, the Lord is a shepherd, you always seem like you go back to uh, Psalm 23, and, and there's this new novel idea that God was the shepherd of David. Well, you would be wrong if I asked you that question. Because it's actually Jacob who says that God is my shepherd. Listen to what it says again. The God who has been my shepherd all my life to this day, he described God as his shepherd. Now, David was not the first person who ever was the shepherd of sheep. He was the shepherd boy, but... He wasn't the first one. What did Jacob spend his life doing? He spent his life as a shepherd. You remember that? I mean, how did he get all of his wealth? He watched over the sheep and the goats of Laban. And, and when the children of Israel made their way over to this land, what, were their, what was their occupation? They were shepherds who had flocks that would live in the grazing land of Goshen. All of his life he had been a shepherd. And he knew what it was to be a shepherd. And when he saw what it was to be a shepherd, and then he moves into this relationship with God, as he has this relationship with God, he says, the best way for me to describe, just like David would eventually, the best way for me to describe the relationship I have with God is he's my shepherd. He's just my shepherd. He, he provides for me everything I need. He's all that I need. Now, if you want to find, hold your hand here for just a minute and turn over, not to the 23rd Psalm, but I want you to turn over to Ezekiel. So you can find the prophet Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 34. Ezekiel chapter 34. In Ezekiel 34 is a prophecy against the shepherds of Israel, and then it's a statement about what God said that he would be in regard to his sheep. I want to begin reading in verse 11. This is the best description of a shepherd. What a shepherd does and who a shepherd is. Look what it says in verse 11 of Ezekiel 34. 
For thus says the Lord God, Behold, I myself will search for my sheep and seek them out. As a shepherd cares for his herd in the day when he is among his scattered sheep, so I will care for my sheep and will deliver them from all the places to which they were scattered on a cloudy and gloomy day. And I'll bring them out from the people and gather them from the countries and bring them to their own land. And I will feed them on the mountains of Israel by the streams and in all the inhabited places of the land. I will feed them in good pasture and their grazing ground will be upon the mountain heights of Israel. There they will lie down in good grazing ground. They will feed in rich pastures on mountains in, of Israel. I will feed my flock I will lead them to rest, declares the Lord. I will seek the lost, bring back the scattered, bind up the broken, and strengthen the sick. But the fat and the strong I will destroy. I will feed them with judgment. What do you say a shepherd does? A shepherd feeds his flock. He provides for them. He leads his flock to rest. He says, I will seek those that are lost I will gather those that are scattered. I will bring them back. I will bind up the one that is broken, and I will strengthen the one that is sick. I will care for my sheep. And you know what Jacob says when he's talking to Joseph? He says, the Lord that I serve, the God that I know, he has been that kind of shepherd to me. He's led me. Oh, hasn't he ever led him? He has fed me and provided for me. When I've got scattered and, and I've got away, he's drawn me back. When I've been lost, he has found me. He's protected me. He has cared for my soul. I have a relationship with God where God is my shepherd. The one who has watched over me, the one who has cared for me in every experience of my life, he has cared for me. Don't miss this, what he says there back in uh, chapter 48, verse 15. The Lord, the God who has been my shepherd all my life, listen, to this day. What is this day? What's this day for him? This day for him is, is the time for his drawing death. He's about to go through what David described as that valley of the shadow of death. Remember how David described that in Psalm 23? He's about to enter through that, but, but Jacob enters with great confidence. He enters with a peace in his heart. He says that same God who's fed me, who's led me, who's cared for me, who's gathered me when I've scattered and found me when I'm lost. That same God is a God who's with me to this very day. He's a God who helps me this very day, who ministers to me this very day. What a difference it makes. What a difference it makes whenever you're able to approach that time which we all will face, that time of death, with that kind of peace in your heart. I was reminded of that yesterday because I got a call. Mr. Clyde Braxton, a member of our fellowship, he's 88 years old. Mr. Clyde had been, he's had aneurysm problems ever since I've been here. I had a number of surgeries. But his aneurysm, had another aneurysm, started leaking. And so they gave him units of blood here. They transported him over to UAB for a possible surgery. But whenever they got there, uh, they consulted with a doctor and the doctor told him he only had about 75% of uh, a chance to even survive or get out of surgery. And that if he had surgery, he'd be on dialysis for the rest of his life and his quality of life wouldn't be that, that much. So Brother Clyde and his family in consultation decided to opt not to have surgery, but just to, uh, to allow the Lord to do whatever he would do and in regard to that. And he was losing blood and hadn't been given units of blood. And, Doctors don't give him just a couple of days, probably at the most, to live. I wasn't able to be there because I was getting back from vacation, but Don was there and talked to Don. And, and what Don said didn't surprise me a bit because he, he said, Miss Clyde told him, he said, well, Brother Don said, I, 
I don't think I'm going to make it out of this one. I don't think I'm going to make it out of this. He's been on that table many times. I don't think I'm going to make it out of this one. But that's all right. I'm prepared. I'm ready to go. And I know where I'll be. I talked to his son last night, Terry. We're talking on the phone, sharing. And we going back over that. And I told him, I said, man, that's, that's a great blessing. It's a great blessing for Mr. Clyde to feel that way. It's a great blessing for you as his children to have that kind of peace that he knows that his shepherd will care for him in this day. To have that kind of peace in your heart and that kind of peace in your life that the same God who watches over you when you're young and through every experience of life is the God who watches over you and especially takes care of you in that day of your death. And that's what Jacob was saying. Listen, my days are coming to an end. It's the end of my journey. The God who's cared for me, the God who's been my shepherd, the God who's watched over me, he's the same God who's going to watch over me this day. What a blessing that is. And I hope and pray that you, whenever you come to the end of your journey, end of your life, that you might have that kind of testimony. You might have that kind of peace in your heart that you might know that the shepherd is watching over and caring for your every need. But that's not all he said. So what else he said in Genesis 48? The God before whom my fathers, Abraham and Isaac, walked, a God of heritage, the God who's been my shepherd all the days of my life, caring for me, ministering to me, watching over me, even up to this very day. Listen to what it says in verse 16. And the angel who has redeemed me from all evil. Isn't that interesting? And the angel who has redeemed me from all evil. Now, you know what that's talking about, don't you? He goes back to that experience back there when he wrestles with the angel of God. Now, I would hope you were here when we, when we preached through that message, but you remember we talked about any time the angel of God is there, many times that's a theophany. That's, that's a pre-incarnate Christ appearing. And most theologians believe that's what it was. It wasn't an angel who was wrestling with uh, Jacob, but it was actually God who was wrestling with Jacob in the form of Jesus, coming and grabbing a hold of Jacob and wrestling with him. You remember that experience? He didn't fight him. He didn't hit him. He grabbed hold of him, and he wasn't going to let him go, and he was holding on to it. And, he, and, he, and finally, when it comes to the point of saying, man, I, what, what is your name? And Jacob says, man, my, my name is Jacob. It's a point of confession in his life when he has to acknowledge that I'm an old deceiver. I'm an old wretched sinner. I, there's wickedness in my heart. That was his point of conversion. When he actually confesses his sin, his life is changed. His heart is cleansed and God changed his name and called him Israel. And that's what old Jacob grabs hold and says, I'm not going to let you go till you bless me. That you'll bless me as you have promised and you'll be that God to me that you want to be. Well, when he refers back to that angel, he's referring back to that angel of God who would be Jesus, the Son of God. And here's the neat thing about it. Jacob is saying more than he knows because in reality, it is that one who wrestled with him. It is that one who is the Son of God. It is that theophany who is eventually going to be the one who comes incarnate, who comes and lives 33 years in this world, and who's eventually going to die on a cross, pay the price for sin, and will be the one who forgives all sin of all times, Old Testament and New Testament. He forgives those who put their faith and their trust in Him faith and trust in God. And when Jacob back there confessed his sin and moved into a relationship, a faith relationship with God who is his shepherd, do you know what happened? It was marked on his certificate, paid in full, yet to be paid at the cross, but by faith it is counted as paid. So what is he able to say? He speaks the truth. And the angel, Jesus, that one that wrestled with me, he is the one who has redeemed me from all evil. I'll tell you something, friend. If you didn't get another thing out of that, if you could learn that truth, that principle, it would set your life free. It would set your life free. You hear what he said? 
He set me free. He's forgiven me of all of my sin. He paid the price. He redeemed me from all of my evil. That fellow had done a lot of evil, and he only had a little bit of his Bible record in the Bible recorded about him. He had been an old deceiver. He'd been a cheat. He had done evil things. But you know what he said? Whenever I met him, and when he grabbed hold of me, he forgave me of all my sin. Did you know most people don't know that? Most of you don't know that. You, you still think he's having to forgive you of your sin. You, you think today, whenever you, whenever you sin today, he's going to have to forgive you of your sin tonight so you can go to sleep. I'm here to tell you something. You're already forgiven of your sin. It's already paid for in full. When he died on that cross, he paid for all your sin, past, present, and future. For all mankind, he paid for it. And the day that you ask Jesus to come into your heart and your life, and the day you ask his blood to be over your sin, you are forgiven of your sin, all sin, past, present, and future. It's paid in full. You say, well, what do I do, Brother Mac? I mean, what am I supposed to do? I still sin. I know you do, but you've been forgiven. What he asks you to do is not to ask him to forgive you. You're forgiven. You confess it. That's what he says, confess it. And confession is to mean to agree with God. Whenever I sin today, I don't have to ask Jesus to forgive me. He's already forgiven me. What I simply do is just say, Lord, I'm sorry. I agree with you that what I said, what I did, what I thought was sin. I realize that's not pleasing to you. I confess that. But I thank you that Jesus already forgave me. I thank you that I'm clean and cleansed. I've been redeemed from all my sin. If you're saved, you're redeemed. And how liberated it is, how liberating it was to him to know that that angel, the Son of God, redeemed me from all my evil, from all the evil that I'd ever done. He, he made me clean. He made me right. Now, some of you look like, well, I'm not sure about that. Well, then I wouldn't go to bed tonight. If that's not true, I wouldn't go to bed. I, I surely wouldn't go to bed without making sure I could and ask forgiveness for every one of my sin. Then you better go to sleep in a hurry. And you better hope during your sleep you don't sin. You can sin in your sleep. Did you know that? You can think things you ought not think. You ever dream things you ought not dream? Don't look so holy to me. <laughs> oh, yeah, you can have things. So you're in trouble. What if you die before you get to confess that one that you just said, and you die an hour later? You're dead. You're, you're lost. Well, it's just a little bit of sin. A little bit of sin send you to hell. Right? This means yes. That's the truth. What do you believe the rest of it? That's the truth. One sin will send you to hell. You have to be forgiven. And do you know when you're forgiven? When you ask Jesus into your heart. He redeemed you, paid the price for all your sin. <laughs> and that's what Jacob said. Listen, three things I want you to know. Three things he says to Joseph. I want you to know, listen, I was blessed with father and a grandfather who walked before God and showed me about God. And then I've had the privilege of, of God taking care of me. Even when I was an old rebellious thing and, and I was a lost sheep, I was running away. I didn't want him to be in charge of me. I didn't, he'd go grab me, he'd bring me back. And he'd feed me and he'd care for me. He was my shepherd. Even to this very day, he's been my shepherd. But the greatest thing of all is that angel, that day, he redeemed me from all my evil. From that day on, I've been clean for God. From that day on, what was your experience? His experience was, was by a brook, by a stream. Where was your experience? For there has to be that experience in your life. 
for that day when you ask Jesus to come into your heart, come into your life, to redeem you, to forgive you. What an experience. This, this old man is about to die. Three things. He wants Joseph and those grandsons to know about his walk with God. I don't know what you'd tell your sons, your daughters, your grandchildren, but I wish you could be able to tell them those three things. If you didn't tell them but those three things, you would have told them a lot. And you'd give them a lot to follow and a pattern to set in their life. Do you know him? As shepherd, as redeemer, you know the joy of being forgiven? You know the peace of being under his leadership as a shepherd? What a blessing. Something he passed on, something we might be able to pass on, but you can't pass it on unless you have it.